Hey, welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and this is episode 14, coming at ya. All right, so we've got more scandal. Juicy little scandals, tidbits of gossip and whatnot. But honestly, I, I really don't want to do this. I'm, 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 I'm a people pleaser inside. It's part of a, um, uh, part of my identity. It's who I am. Uh, but I have to kill that identity because it's the flesh. That being said, um, I really don't like doing this. In one sense, Ed Litton is lying, uh, and I feel obliged to talk about it because a lot of other people aren't talking about it. Um. Dr. Moeller, uh, he's commented on it years ago. Um, D.A. Carson wrote an article. I tried to find that article. I couldn't find that article. It was on the Gospel Coalition in 2010, supposedly. I'm sure somebody might be able to find it in the uh, archive of you know the Wayback Machine or whatever that thing's called. Welcome back to the Albert Muller Program. The word is plagiarism, and uh, it is not necessarily a common part of the vocabulary of day-to-day -day Americans, just thinking about uh, the, the moral issues of the day. We understand embezzling and lying. We understand adultery and divorce. We, we understand issues that have moral consequence, but a lot of people simply do not have the vocabulary word plagiarism right directly at hand. Let me tell you what it is. It is intellectual theft. It's the theft of someone else's ideas presented as your own, or someone else's words, or someone else's material. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you where it comes up more than any, any place else, and that's in the academic world, where we have to be always on guard against plagiarism. Uh, let me give you an example. Say you have a graduate student who's writing a thesis in, in, in geology, and uh, all of a sudden someone reading this says, I think I've read this before, and you discover that what the student did was just copy paragraph after paragraph from an established text in geology, and you realize, okay, this, this is not his ideas. He's not even synthesized these ideas. He hasn't documented this. He's writing this and claiming this as if he, he did it himself. In the literary world, there have been recent scandals, uh, and, and some associated with some of the biggest names in both fiction and nonfiction writing, and uh, this has, has really racked the publishing world, because there are enormous legal consequences here. You know, if you, if you steal material from, uh, from, for instance, Ernest Hemingway and publish it as your novel, you're going to hear from Ernest Hemingway's publisher, who owns the rights to that material. The word plagiarism is the stuff of lawyers, litigation, courtrooms, and academic seminar rooms, doctoral work, and dissertations, and faculty committees. But now, it's a word that a lot of church members are learning, too. Why? Because in this day of instant access to thousands of sermons over the Internet, in the day when so many sermons are available in printed and in audio form in various ways, it turns out that there are a good number of preachers who simply aren't going into the study and spending hours and hours each week preparing sermons. Instead, they're preaching someone else's material. The Wall Street Journal, November 15, 2006. Headline story, that sermon you heard on Sunday, maybe from the web, is about a particular pastor whose name I will not mention, who spoke in the first person, an extended illustration, uh, presented the entire sermon as if it was his own, talked in the first person, I did this, I did that, I experienced this, and it turns out it was nothing but. In fact, he was preaching a sermon that was preached three years ago by Ed Young, pastor of Fellowship Church in Grapevine, Texas. You follow through the story in the Wall Street Journal, to which we will provide links tonight, and you'll discover it's not just this preacher, it's not just stealing from that preacher, it's all kinds of borrowing going on. My guest today is Dr. Herschel York, who's Associate Dean of the School of Theology, Professor of Preaching at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. York, welcome to the program. Thank you, Dr. Muller. Glad to be here. Okay. How much of a problem is this? I mean, you, you probably have a, a greater opportunity to observe preachers in the making and to hear preachers across this country. How big an issue is this? Well, it's a great issue because, frankly, pastors aren't given enough time, devoting enough time to study the Word themselves. They're getting so caught up in the business of ministry and keeping the machinery of the church going that they give short attention to their own study of the Word, to coming up with sermons. And it's just so easy to get on the Internet and find someone else's outline, someone else's sermon, and, and to cut and paste and make it your own. How widely is it understood that that is morally the equivalent of, uh, say, borrowing someone's car without permission? Uh, it's it's less understood now than it used to be uh, because there are some out there who are advocating it. There are uh, some famous websites and, and some pretty well-known preachers who are encouraging people to take their material intact and preach it that way. And uh, because they're encouraging them to do it, other pastors feel like they have permission, and therefore they can do it. And so sort of, it creates a culture of uh, sort of shared responsibility for preaching. Preacher in Cincinnati, confronted by this uh, ministry basically over uh, because of this. Uh, pr preacher in Salt Lake City, preacher in Oklahoma City, preacher in, in various towns, you could just name them all, all across the country, uh, who have been embarrassed and, uh, and exposed as preaching other person's material. Uh, my guess is 
that you could find preachers in every single community who are now habitually doing this. Yes, but also there are some now that just freely admit it, and they, they defend it. They're saying, well, this is, uh, I read one pastor's defense of it. He called it mentoring rather than plagiarism. And so that that is a shift. Before, if someone was caught doing it and exposed, they felt the need to apologize. Now there are many that don't. Yeah, I, I just find that absolutely shocking. I can't imagine doing that. I can't imagine, you know, words are our business. And I can't imagine preaching someone else's words or, or copying someone else's words and claiming those are my own. That was Dr. Moeller and Dr. Herschel York. I've had both of them in class. I had York twice, three times, and Moeller once. It was kind of elective. He wasn't really there because he's so busy. Uh, but I've, I respect both these men deeply. Uh, I have been influenced by both of these men a lot. And I don't know what's going on. This was in 2006, this audio. So this is 15 years ago that you heard this uh, or that you just heard. Has their opinions changed? Dr. Moeller, have your opinions changed about plagiarism uh, or Dr. York? I mean, I've looked at both your guys' Twitters, uh, both your websites, and there's no mention of Lytton at all. There's no mention of plagiarism at all. Um, gentlemen, I, I, I don't, I don't, are we serving Christ or are we serving ourselves? Are we serving the SBC or are we serving the Lord Jesus who's risen from the dead? This is a big deal. Like, seriously, this is a big deal. And this is our denomination. I am a Southern Baptist pastor. I went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I am a member at a Southern Baptist church. I have been in the convention for seven years. Not, not that long, but long enough. And even if I hadn't been, even if I'm somebody outside, this is still unacceptable. Because even if it's allowed, and somehow that Lytton has not borrowed these sermons, but in fact... Um, is just buying sermons. There's there's one called Docent Research Group, I believe it is, and they can give such. The program goes on. I'll send the link. It put it in there as well of the Albert Muller program. It's a radio show he used to do. He doesn't do it anymore. And he goes on to talk about uh, a man uh, in Rick Warren's church who's been doing this a long time. And I had somebody comment last time on one of the other videos. Uh, in the video I did, uh, episode 11, I think it is, on this and asking, what about Rick Warren? What about this? What about that? I've not heard mentioned. Well, that was news to me. I've never heard of that either. But, you know, I'm not omniscient. So now we know that that's a common thing. And Moeller just mentioned people in, guy in Salt Lake, guy in Oklahoma, guy in Maryland or wherever it was. This is prevalent. And I mean, in 2006, 15 years ago, now we're talking even more in 2021. So this is, I mean... I don't want to brag, but I've literally been preaching for months and months and months, seven months, nonstop. It's just how the schedule's worked out. I have written every single one of my sermons. Again, I don't say that to brag. It takes a lot of time. You have to read. You have to study. You have to be attentive to the Spirit. You have to pray. You have to do stuff. And I just, it's just astounding that people would do this. But that's why you have more pastoral staff, more men to lead and to um, help. I mean, what did Moses do? He had like a million Israelites, right? And Jethro, his father-in-law, well, you got to delegate. You got to do this and that. So you got to break up responsibility. You can't have one guy be the pastor of, you know, a church of 500 or even 200 is, is difficult. You need other leaders, other pastors, other elders, other men to help lead. So again, I, I, I call on Dr. Moeller and Dr. York, guys, please address this. Please address this because this is unacceptable that Lytton has done this. Uh, it's unacceptable that he has lied about it. And even if he, even if it was all right with J.D. Greer or he got this from Docent Research Group or somebody else and it's just a sermon, you said yourself 15 years ago, has your opinions changed, Dr. Moeller? Especially you said, this is not okay, words are our business, so on and so forth. I can't imagine, you said, preaching someone else's words, as in the first person, using illustration. That's exactly what Ed Lytton did. We have the evidence more than once. But we need to know who we're serving. Are we? Is the world watching? Yes, the world's watching. And they're going to say, SBC, you guys are full of dead men's bones. You're full of hypocrisy. Do you want to be full of hypocrisy? I don't. I don't want you to be either. I don't want to be have the de denomination and the school and your names tarred and feathered. I don't want Lytton to be tarred and feathered. I don't want him to have gone through this. I want him to acknowledge what's going on. No one, I looked at Twitter just now. I looked at uh, a few 
other guys, including Moeller, uh, who I love Dr. Moeller, I really do. But is this why you didn't win the presidency, Dr. Moeller? Why, why Adams and Stone didn't win? Because you guys don't plagiarize sermons? Maybe you should have stolen a J.D. Greer sermon or two or three or 20. The world is watching. I remember them saying that at the SBC and the world's watching. And we're going to look at some clips right now um, from Lytton and also somebody else and also some other stuff. Ugh. You take it out and, like I said last week, you can open it up or you can turn it on. Um, if you wear skinny jeans and you're super cool and you turn your Bible on, do that right now. Um, my pastor used to say that he loved to hear the sound of ruffling pages. I just had to give that up. But I do love to see the warm glow of, uh, of, 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 of Scripture on people's faces when I preach. So turn it on. Open your Bibles, if you would. Uh, turn them on. Warm them up. I see the, I love the rustle of uh, the sound of the pages of Scripture. Also now have to enjoy the warm glow of your iPad, your iPhone, your whatever your device is. Open up to Acts chapter 4. And one of the biggest objections that's people have to Christianity, or at least one that I have heard over the years as I've talked with people, is the idea that Christianity is too narrow. Um, the idea that there is only one way to God um, just sounds like it's, um, it's arrogant for us to say that, or it's unfair. You know, the, the idea is, is, is like you got somebody who you know, has never heard about Jesus, and when they die, God shows up at their deathbed and says, aha, you didn't receive Jesus. And they're like, Jesus who? And he says, well, it's too late now, and he casts their souls into hell. And as they go tumbling into hell, screaming, wait, wait, you know, he mumbles in Latin like tough cookies. First, you'll hear people say it's too narrow. You cannot say there's only one way to heaven. And, and they, they always paint a picture, it seems, of they, I'm the people I've talked to, will often paint a picture, well, okay, this is cruel God, guy on his deathbed, hey, I'm going to throw you into hell. You go, wait, 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 as he's falling, I, I didn't hear, I didn't know there was another way. And in Latin, he says, tough cookies, boom. Plus, it's kind of an unspoken rule in our society that you just don't tell people that their religion is wrong. It's never right to tell another religion they're wrong. If you want to be thought of as a civilized, educated person, do not say anything that would imply that your belief system, that you think your belief system is superior to somebody else's. So the rule in our society is you can be really sincere about your religion. That's good. Just don't be too excited about it. Certainly not so excited that you're trying to convert other people into it. If you want to be thought of as intelligent, if you want to be respected by your peers, you never hold up your belief system as being greater than someone else's. In our culture, it's okay to have any religion you choose, but it's not okay to try to make converts to your religion. It's not okay to get carried away and radicalize yourself, to overdose, if you will. And the Sadducees had a couple of, of problems. Um, number one, they didn't like Jesus because Jesus had been a threat to their power, and they didn't believe in him as the Messiah. Number two, just as a group, they rejected the whole concept of the resurrection from the dead. So they had no Messiah and no hope, and that's why they were sad, you see. Who points out it was the Sadducees leading this. The Sadducees did not believe the word of God. They believed it was poetry. They didn't believe it was literal. They didn't believe Moses wrote the first five books. They didn't believe they were liberals. They didn't believe because of that in the resurrection of the dead. So they did not believe in eternal life. They had no hope for the future. That's why they are sad, you see. I read an article this week um, called the Evangelical Adoption Scam. Did you know, New York Times several years ago had an article on how evangelical Christians are adopting children from around the world. The name of the article, you can Google it, is the Evangelical Adoption Scam. And the article said this. It said evangelicals suffer from pathological altruism. And this is why they, they criticize Christians for doing this. They said that they have a pathological altruism. I sent this to one of our other pastors um, who said back, he said, you know, when the best slur that you can come up with is to label somebody a pathological altruist, I'll take it. Imagine being criticized for having a pathological altruism. Friend, if you've got to have a problem, that's a good problem to have. You know, when I was in college, I heard this. One of my professors told me this parable. It was my freshman year in college. I had a professor of a religious survey course at the University of Arizona tell us this parable. It's probably the first time I ever heard the parable. It, the parable actually comes from India. It came out of India many, many years ago. He said, he, said, he said, our quest for God is like three blind men that fall into a pit. You heard this? Three blind men fall into a pit. There's an elephant in there. It's the parable of three blind men who fall into a pit, and in that pit is an elephant. It's not good. I mean, it's really not good. And again, I, I want to be generous, but this is alternative media um, because I'm not, I don't have anybody above me. <laughs> There's nobody telling me what to do other than YouTube. And, you know, YouTube probably doesn't even know I exist. Hi, YouTube. Um, you will eventually. No. But no one's talking about this. They should be talking about this. I think someone mentioned um, that the president of Midwestern Seminary, one of the six Southern Baptist seminaries. Um, oh, I can't remember his name. I feel so bad now. Jason Allen. He is, has mentioned this, but nobody else. So it's very troubling. Uh, I know some others... And I'll, I'll put it in the link if I remember it in the comments. But, um, you know, Founders Ministry and a few others have, have mentioned this. 
because they care about Lytton and his soul, right? They care about, like, if this is, if cheating is happening, which it is, it ha- it's very evident now. There's been multiple sermons now, not just the Romans one that I, I talked about last episode or a few episodes ago, but multiple, multiple other sermons uh, and some other stuff that we'll see here that is just completely disqualifying. It's not even close to saying, hey, you know what? I had a bad week. Uh, I had a bad season. I've been really, really pressed. I had a lot of funerals, a lot of weddings, a lot of this, a lot of that, a lot of stress in my life. Okay, like understandable. Well, JD JD said I could use it. Uh, okay, but you're still being disingenuous, right? You're still you're still lying to your congregation. Maybe you're not uh, stealing. Okay, fine. Maybe you didn't steal it, but you're being disingenuous. However, that doesn't really work with le- like using the term like permission or consent or it's legal, right? Like abortion is legal. Um, uh, prostitution in a lot of places is legal. Lots of recreational drugs are legal. Um, abuse in certain situations in certain parts of the world is legal. Slavery is legal in a lot of parts of the world. And so just because it's legal, just because people say it's fine or the other person is consenting, that's nonsense. What does the scripture say? What what are you trying to do or what should you be doing as a pastor, as a leader, as a man in the congregation, in the community, leading people, being an example for Christ, and so on? Got coffee today. I think it's from Nicaragua. It's really good. So we're going to look at some videos here um, and we'll get some thoughts, okay? Maybe the classic text, the longest, the, the, the most famous text in the entire Bible on the subject of marriage. To Ephesians chapter 5, the greatest passage in all of Scripture. Uh, on the issue and the subject of marriage. Uh, so far, we've only looked at the first two. And today, I want to get to, tonight, I want to get to the third. And the first two are the power of marriage and the definition of marriage. We're going to recap the last two messages. So the power of marriage, the definition of marriage, and the priority of marriage. The essence of marriage is a covenant, a legal, legal commitment. The essence of marriage, we said last week, is a legal commitment, a binding covenant with one another. What is a legal? What makes a marriage a marriage? What makes a marriage a marriage? A priest can marry, a minister can marry, justice of the peace, marriage is marriage. It doesn't matter whether it's a captain on a ship. It doesn't matter whether it's a justice of the peace. Marriage is marriage. Some people say, well, I mean, I got married by a priest. Did I get married? Do I get married by a pastor, a justice of the peace, a judge, or a sea captain? I mean, does it matter where you get married? I, I don't think that it matters who performs the ceremony. Marriage pops up. Originally, it was given to Adam and Eve. It wasn't given to only Christians. It was given to human beings as human beings. God created marriage and gave it to mankind. The first man, the first woman, were the only man and the only woman. And God said, here, I give you marriage. So marriage is for all groups, all races, all nationalities, all nations, and frankly, all religions. What does it make you married? What makes you married is this, a permanent and exclusive public legal commitment to share your lives together, all aspects of it. It's got to be permanent, it's got to be exclusive. Really, what is marriage? It is a permanent, exclusive, legal relationship. So some people say it's time to have renewable contract marriages. You get married for three years and you have an option for three more. <laughs> You've heard that. Now that might be interesting, but that's not a marriage. What's actually happening with the Y generation, and it's quite frightening, is that we're now hearing, suggested, that what marriage needs to be now defined as is maybe a three-year contract with a three-year option. In other words, a three-year contract with a three-year option for good behavior. That's not biblical marriage. What absorbs it? What absorbs it is the servant heart. And let me give you three constituent parts to it. The ability to hear criticism without being crushed. There are three things that reveal whether or not we have a servant's heart. And these are three important statements. And the first one is the ability to hear criticism and correction without being crushed. We know we have a servant heart. Secondly, the ability to give criticism without being, without crushing, without crushing. The second indicator is the ability to give criticism and correction without crushing. Uh, thirdly, the ability to forgive people without residual anger. And the third feature that reveals whether or not we have a servant heart is the ability to forgive without lingering anger. That's what I mean by servant heart. The ability to take your mind off yourself. A servant heart is the ability to take your mind off of yourself and to care about the other person. Every human being, Romans 1 says, has got something, some form of religion, something they worship, something they say, if I get that, then I'll be all right. The problem is every human being at their core is religious. They're religious. Romans chapter 1 tells us that. Now, somebody's out there saying, sure, sure. Yet your wife yells at you, and you're sitting there thinking about Jesus Christ as your brother and your friend, and you're cradle security through his grace and vulnerability. You say, no, wait, wait, wait a second. Are you serious? I mean, when my wife yells at me or corrects me or, or says I'm not doing something I ought to be doing, you're saying I'm supposed to go, oh, wait a second, Jesus is my brother, he's my helper, he's my friend, he loves me. <laughs> what a Christian does, if you love people, eventually you come to like them. The more you act in love toward them, the more you're going to like them. Right. The more you give yourself, the more you make a decision to invest in them, the more you find your heart tied up to them. You know why? Because the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Maverick, when you act in love toward somebody that's hard to love, I promise you what's going to happen is pretty soon you're going to start to love them. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Oriental and Asian uh, readers who originally read this was, were probably shocked by it. You're not shocked by it, but you should be. Almost everywhere else in the world and almost everywhere else in history, 
Your obligation to your parents is a tremendously strong one. If we were Oriental Christians, and probably where Kathy was last week, there are more Oriental-oriented uh, persons out there that would get this. They're from a culture where the patriarchy, the family, is very important, and the parents are very important. What he's saying is God did not put a parent and a child in the garden. He put a man and a woman in the garden, a husband and a wife. God did not put a man and a child in the Garden of Eden. He put a man and a woman. You can fail to leave your father and mother if you hate them. Because you're still being controlled by them. Here's a man who says, I'll never take my kids to church because my father always insisted on taking me to church even though I hated it. And he forced me every year a week until I, until I was 19 years old and I'm never going to take my children to church. Instead of him thinking, is this church true? Is it right? Is it good for my kids? Instead of thinking about this on its own merits, he's controlled by his father. You are going to be surprised. You may be more dependent upon your parents than you realize. Your hatred and lack of forgiveness for your parents and their struggles as parents, which we all have, is controlling your life. It's like the guy who says, oh, my daddy drug me to church. Mom, I'm never going to take my kids to church. Well, what if your kids need to go to church? What if their deepest need is to go to church? Th then your daddy is still controlling your parenting. This is bad because now it's not just uh, Ed Litton and J.D. Greer, but it's also Tim Keller. Listen to that. So now his wife is preaching. Also that. Unbelievable. That's against the Baptist faith and message. That's against Titus. That's against Timothy. That's against 1 Corinthians uh, 11. This is serious. Now, I hope you stick around. Uh, this is going to be a little bit longer video than normal. Uh, you can obviously tell by the length of it uh, when it's all complete. His but, church needs to deal with this. But sadly, we're going to look a little bit further at this next clip. That therefore there in verse 1, that therefore that starts that chapter is the hinge of the entire book of Romans. You see, Romans, if you're doing it in the simplest way to think about it, Romans is divided into two major sections. Chapters 1 through 11, Paul is telling you all about what the gospel is, 11 chapters worth. In the last five chapters, he's going to start to unpack what you should be because of the gospel. But the second word is therefore. It says, I appeal to you therefore. But what is that therefore, therefore? So when you take a 30,000 foot view of the book of Romans and pretty much any of Paul's letters, we see that there are two massive sections of the letter. The first 11 chapters, Paul is telling you about the gospel and what it is. In the last five chapters, he begins to unpack what you should do because of it. And those two sections, what the gospel is and what you should be, are joined together by a single word. One word that's the hinge of the whole book, and that word is, therefore. And in these, these two massive sections, they're joined together by one word, therefore. In Romans 12, 1, this is the hinge of those two sections. This is the hinge of the book of Romans. All right, so here we go. Number one, here's the Christian life, Paul says, as living sacrifice. Paul obviously is drawing on Jewish imagery here. Jews, of course, grew up offering sacrifices to God, but even Gentiles in those days would have been familiar with this concept. Obviously, Paul is drawing some, he's drawing on some Jewish imagery here because the Jews, they grew up giving and making sacrifices and the Gentiles, they would have been very much familiar with this concept. The first he says is that the Christian sacrifice of their body is living. Sacrifices in the Old Testament were always dead. Our sacrifice is living. Old Testament sacrifices were always dead. The problem with the living sacrifice is that it wants to keep getting up and crawling down off the altar. And now the problem with the living sacrifice is that it keeps wanting to get off the altar, right? You should do it in response to the gospel. That's the second way. Is that it's not done to obtain salvation, but in response to it. You see, religious sacrifices in those days, particularly pagan ones, were done to gain something from God, forgiveness or blessing or whatever. Or religious sacrifices in those days, in those days they, whether Jewish or pagan, they were always done to gain something from God. Well, Paul spent 11 chapters telling you you've already got that as a gift in Christ. It's impossible to be more forgiven or more blessed than you already are in him. And Paul just spent the last 11 chapters talking about how you cannot be any more forgiven or have any more favor because of Christ. Transformed. Um, it, it's a Greek word, metamorpho. And, it, and, and, and it's where we get the word, obviously, metamorphosis. And the second commandment he gives is to be transformed. And that Greek word is where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's, it means to be changed from within. It's the word we now use to describe what happens to a, a caterpillar when they sew themselves up in a cocoon. It's the process that a caterpillar goes through to turn into a, a butterfly. And it's just like Christ. Taylor Anderson. Redemption Church, Romans 12. So we can see here that is um, his, Ed Litton's, associate pastor at the same church. Different man, same church. And so this is not a one-off or a two-off or a five-off. This is holistically because there's other scripture. We looked at the last episode in episode 11. Right here. Episode 11 with Romans chapter one, right? Where God's whispering about sexual sin, which means I guess we shouldn't take it seriously, but we should really take seriously pride and, and, and envy and, and religious pharisaicalism and that, all that stuff, right? The stuff that the people who are saying that want to then point at other people and say, wow, you're just being a Pharisee, blah, 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 blah. Well, all sin is heinous to God, including lying and stealing. I mean, what is... The end of Revelation say, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire, along with cowards. I mean, are we going to believe the text or not?
Are we going to believe God's word or not? Are we just going to say it? Are we going to stand against the world and say, well, you know, I'm for Christ. Okay, fine. These people are clearly not for Christ over here. These people with the flags, these people with the protests, these people with over here, they're killing their babies, whatever. Sure, we can stand against them, but also love them. But what about our brethren? What about our brothers and sisters who are in sin? Does Matthew 18 not apply to this situation? I mean, this is public now, widely public. And again, I don't really like doing this. I mean, I'm saying it honestly because Few people are saying it. Other people, most guys uh, are like me, who have a YouTube channel or, or some sort of minor, tiny little influence. But if Dr. Moeller or Herschel York, Dr. Herschel York, or, or even D.A. D. Carson, who wrote an article that now I can't find, supposedly I have not seen the article, someone else had mentioned it in uh, this whole craziness about plagiarism, it was back in 2010 for the Gospel Coalition. Who is our Lord? The world is watching. That was said more than once. God's watching, right? Let's not forget that. But it's just, I mean, this is why people say the SBC is nothing but a bunch of pragmatists, nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, nothing but a bunch of just fat cats and the elites leading a certain direction. I mean, forget all the woke nonsense or all the, you know, social justice, CRT, CRTI, critical theory in general, all the intersectionality and the teaching or lack thereof or what we're really doing in the seminaries and churches. Forget all that for a moment. Just forget it. If Ed Litton and his pastor, associate pastor, were in fact doing these things, but they were, I don't know, stealing cars, right? What if, what if there was like grand theft auto happening on a regular basis? When we say something, right? If he was with prostitutes, even if it was in Las Vegas where it's legal. Is that not okay? Of course it's not okay. It's sin. Oh, it's legal. Yeah, he just borrowed this sermon from J.D. Greer. He just borrowed this whole 46 sermon series from J.D. Greer. No big deal. And he gave his associate pastor one too, because remember, he has a team of eight. I don't have a team of eight. Most pastors don't have a team of eight or a team of one, barely. <laughs> I'm just me. Most pastors are that way. Forget the SBC. That's just in general. Most churches are only a few hundred people at max. And most are much smaller than that. There's not no teams. What are you doing during your week, Dr. Litton? What, 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 are, you, what are you doing that's causing you to not spend time in the word? Are you not to shepherd the flock? Are you not to stave off the wolves? Are you not to guard against false teaching? The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, a husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Where is the spine? Where is the response? Where is the resolve to do what is right? How are you going to stave off false teachers in an attack when there's real persecution happening? Actual, real assaults against your church and against you, against your community, when you're living in sin. Stealing, or maybe you didn't steal. Okay, fine, maybe you didn't steal. But maybe he, maybe you, Lytton, you're not watching this probably, but maybe somebody will. But you're lying. You're lying. And you need to repent of that. This is, this, is, this is heinous. You're ruining Christ's example. Your, your, your example as a Christian. I mean, forget even changing your church's doctrinal statement on the day after on Wednesday when you were elected. Well, you had a partialist view of the Trinity, which is a heresy. You, you got the Trinity wrong? I mean, really? That's, that's a little much. Like, how did you get the Trinity wrong? Oh, well, we changed it. We fixed it. Well, I admit, we, oversight, sorry. Really? Oversight? I mean, how, how did you miss that? 
Here's Lytton. He's talking to the uh, news. And let's just see what he says. Lytton is also seeing how brutal things can be as the leader of the largest Protestant group less than two weeks after becoming president. You've been charged with plagiarism. Allegations Lytton lifted passages in sermons from his predecessor of the convention, J.D. Greer. In a statement, Lytton said he had permission from Greer to use those passages, and Greer agreed. And where did those, where did those charges come from? Do you know? I mean, No, they're unnamed. That's part oh, really? of the problem. Okay. Right. So unnamed sources have have uh, are presenting these things right. which should make everybody take a pause okay so he says they're unnamed okay well justin peters who's uh very well known he's been in ministry a long long time uh, he cares about false teaching a lot he usually deals with health wealth people and uh false teachers like that he's named it there's been multiple compilations done by random people who have gone back and compared jd greer sermons and ed Litton sermons and so it doesn't matter if they're named or not named. If, if, if some guy is driving by and he sees two dudes beating up on another dude and he videos it and he posts it on YouTube and they see the guy's faces and those guys get arrested, do they then get to say, well, hey, these are unnamed sources. I mean, come on. Sure, we beat the crud out of that guy, but <laughs> I mean, you know, they're unnamed. So, you know, we're not guilty. You're still guilty, Lytton. I mean, what's the point in that? You're just skirting. You're not, you're not being Christian at all. You're not understanding your sin and confessing your sin so that you're allowing Christ, who is faithful and just, to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I don't know your heart, but what your actions are right now with your fruit is poisonous. It's wrong. It's really, really bad. It is really bad. And your church should not only discipline you, but you should step down from the presidency. Hands down. This is, this is too much, too much. You want to say unnamed sources? Richard Henry. I'm a source. <laughs> doesn't matter. You probably won't see this again. I don't really care. Someone will. And other people need to call for this man's resignation. He needs a time of restoration. He needs a time of reflection. Because There's multiple places. I mean, we could, we could keep going. I'm going to stop there. Um, Please, please, Lytton, please step down and please enter into a time of restoration, please, for your soul, for your sake, for your church's sake, and ultimately for Christ's sake. Please comment and click the little bell and the like button. It really helps me out for the owl, blah, 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 blah. Can't say it. Maybe you can. I don't know. Don't forget to be against the world for the sake of the world. Take care. Thanks.